friends, and welcome back to another video. I know, this is jarring. I'm standing up. I do, in fact, have legs. I feel like now that I've got this space to move around, I can properly express all of the energy that I have. It's very freeing. So welcome to this, this new era of this channel where I look even more insane than before. The title is not, in fact, clickbait. I read Onision's entire book. Greg has made it very clear that he does not want people hate reading his book. So that's exactly what I did. I read the entire thing with my own two eyes. Listen, I did not have to go this hard. I could have made a response video to something else stupid he did. One thing in particular that you've all been requesting. I could have made a response video to that and gotten just as many views and hundreds of comments like, yes, girl, yes, chop those onions. Now I'm probably just going to get concern. Is it justified? Maybe. Maybe I'm losing my mind. So if you don't know, Greg has actually written three novels, but I decided to start at the beginning. We're, we're taking it back a little bit to where it began with this, this book called Stones to Abigail. So my first impression of this book was that it worked in a way. Like, it felt... it was terrible. Like, it, it was a horrendous experience, but it felt like an authentic experience of just a look into this insufferable high school kid's di high school kid's diary. And then about a third of the way through, it goes absolutely off the goddamn rails into what the fuck land. So I take back my original, I, I take back my original impression. This video is mostly going to give you a look into what the content of this book actually is. I'm gonna lay it all out for you, but I just, I do want to say that I believe Onision wrote this book with the intention of it being a serious publishable novel. However, it's, it's clearly unpublishable in every way, and I feel like he knows that at this point. I would not be surprised if he's tried and failed miserably to have this book published. If anyone was unaware, there's a huge difference between publishing a book and typing up whatever the hell you want and self-publishing it onto the internet. He can't have his book edited because he cannot take even the slightest slightest bit of criticism. I can't think of anything more impersonal than critiquing someone's grammar. Like, it's a grammar. It's not an attack on you as a person, but he cannot handle it. Apparently one of his patrons offered to edit his book for him out of, like, genuinely wanting to help and wanting to see him succeed, and he was just like, no! My books are perfect the way they are. I don't care if my grammar is bad, I write from the heart. So yeah, <laughs> um, I, you can see as I retract into my shirt, I'm not here to lecture Greg or anyone about what is literature and what is publishable. Like, I am in a weird place because I love a lot of things that have typically been excluded from the definition of literature, like science fiction and graphic novels, but at the same time, I have my own strong opinions about the quality of young adult fiction and self-published works. So, at the end of the day, maybe I'm a hypocrite and it doesn't matter and we should all shut up because none of us have the right to gate gatekeep what is considered valuable writing. No matter how garbage I think something is, it could still be meaningful to someone else. But you, dear viewer, are here to see me shit on this terrible book, so I guess I'm gonna do that now. So we enter this book. Our narrator's name is James, but I'm just gonna call him Greg because he is and because I have a lovely friend named James who deserves better. So what we quickly learn about Greg is that he is a little shit with a gigantic god complex who just broods through life reducing everyone around him to overdone high school stereotypes. It's time for a dramatic reading. Excuse me. For as long as I can remember, I've enjoyed seeing how other people move around and talk to each other like they're animals in a zoo. I would try to deliver a more accurate analogy if I felt there was one, but so many of them seem so incredibly unaware of themselves, just living life as they were some gen as the as if it were some generic predefined routine. Sometimes I felt like an alien who had a VIP pass to submerge myself in a primitive human culture just for entertainment. I sense everything I can take in around me. The seemingly limitless audible tones, tremors, and the voices of growing children rang in my ears. In studying people, I found myself gradually learning to literally feel the various personality types I encountered. I hyperanalyzed every inconsistent smell. I took favor in categorizing most everyone around me, the socially inept know-it-all. You mean yourself? <laughs> the dumb attention-seeking drama kid and the bleach blonde bimbo, and he goes on. So yeah, no one is good enough for him except for this random girl he's obsessed with for some reason, and her name is Abby. So they have art class together, and one day in art class, she wants to escape being paired up with this dumb jock named Jason who sits next to her, so she picks Greg as a partner. All I can think about, though, is how jarringly unprofessional their teacher is in this scene. Like, she 
makes fun of a kid for peeing under his desk instead of acting like an adult teacher should in this situation. She's just generally horrible to the kids and nobody thinks this is weird. And after class, Abby gives him a cryptic note. Intrigue. But when school ends, he's on the bus and he sees her kiss her boyfriend Seth, and this apparently crushes all of his dreams that happiness is possible. It's very dramatic. And we also meet Greg's friend Davis, who just makes me deeply uncomfortable because his entire purpose is apparently to compliment Greg. He, that's just what he does. He essentially just worships him, you know, like, like we all do in our normal healthy friendships. And Greg loves him for it. And then, and then Greg finds out that the cryptic note was Abby's phone number and he, he calls her and I did not write down whatever they talked about. So I'm assuming it wasn't interesting. And, and then there's this incident where Jason is being disruptive, the dumb jock from before. Jason is being disruptive in class and Greg is like, no one wants you here, Jason. And being the NPC jock that he is, Jason is obligated to beat up Greg after class. And they both get suspended and Greg cries about it, but he's still manly because he's ashamed of it. And then while he's leaving school, he sees Abby and Seth again and something's going down. So he has to insert himself into the situation. Seth quickly establishes him to be your average bad guy McBad, just, just zero subtlety, zero clever writing. He essentially, if, if this were a show, he essentially turns into the camera and goes, I am an abusive creep and you are not supposed to like me. This is the least immersive reading experience I have had in a long time. So Abby storms off and takes Greg to walk her home and it's raining. So her makeup comes off and he sees that there's bruises on her face. And so we have this absolute gem right here. We stood in the rain for only a few seconds before she asked, do you think makeup really helps anyone? I replied, still looking back at her. I think it helps us forget what we don't want to remember. It lets us pretend we're a little more perfect than we are. She laughed sadly and said, that's one way to put it. I smiled and replied, makeup is just makeup. Skin is just skin. It is what it is. Which doesn't make any sense, especially in response to an abuse victim trying to cover up her bruises. But Abby's like, wow, Greg, that's so fucking deep. But he writes her this letter, which is clearly supposed to be romantic, but I would use the word terrifying, personally, about how he, he sees her pain. No, he wants to understand her deep pain. And when he looks in her eyes, he understands her on a primal level. And he's yearned for her voice all his life. He's talked, he's had like two conversations with this girl. And um, tell me you wouldn't move to another continent if someone did that to you, because I, I think that's the correct response here. So she like briefly ghosts him after that, which is when he has the one moment of self-reflection in, in this entire book where he's like, huh, Maybe that was a weird thing to say to someone, but oh, don't worry, don't worry, that doesn't last. I don't know what it is with these characters and being cryptic as fuck, but Greg gets to class and there's a note on his desk from Abby, like, meet me at the church, that's a good place for some dramatic shit to go down. So he goes to the church and she's there and she's like, I'm not, I'm not a broken thing for you to save. And then immediately monologues about how tragic her life is so that he can step up and say some fake deep shit to save her. And it works. And she's like, wow, Greg, you're so great. I'm going to walk into the goddamn ocean. We only have a lake. Fuck. He gets more drawn to her. He gets more drawn to her the more fucked up he realizes she is, which... You know, being an abuse survivor isn't cute. If that's what you're going through, it's nothing to be ashamed of. But the fact that it's presented through a, the lens of a guy trying to get in her pants. So this girl is going through some genuinely heavy shit, but the fact that it's like so endearing to Greg is disgusting. It's disgusting. That's the correct, that it's just disgusting. So Greg's mom decides to introduce him and his sister to her boyfriend who she's apparently very serious with, but has never mentioned to her kids, which Greg also acknowledges as strange, but not out loud. So the situation just goes on as if it's not weird. And I'm pretty sure the entire th thing just boils down to them awkwardly asking him about his love life uh, so that they can establish how edgy and mysterious and secretive he is. And also to establish that Abby is known as a weird, gross emo kid at their school. And also so that he can slut shame his sister. That's what happens in this scene. And I don't know, that's what happens in, the, uh, that's, I don't know. I, I, I come out of this scene just disoriented. 
My mom inquired, so how's your life going, James? Yeah, this is exactly how parents interact with their teenage kids. Hello, son. Come have some lentils for dinner. This very much feels like an alien trying to recreate human interactions, and I don't know if this is just Greg being a bad writer or this is genuinely how he experiences the world. And I don't know which one I hope it is. <laughs> so now Greg has to go to the school guidance counselor because of the fight that he was in with Jason. And she is just another adult in this story who just isn't an adult. Like, she is so unprofessional. She throws condoms at some kids and there's an obligatory high school abstinence education joke. This adult woman asks Greg about his love life and then cryptically implies that he shouldn't get involved with Abby because she's bad and he's such a smart kid who deserves to succeed. And then she helps him rearrange his school schedule to have classes with her. And the writing in this passage is so cold and bland, just like, this is an interaction that happened today. Somewhat notable, I suppose. Like, no, it was weird. I would not trust this woman with a goddamn gerbil, never mind children's futures, and I have known her for two paragraphs. So he gets back to class, and Abby's there, and he finds out that while he's been gone, she's dug through his bag just for shits and giggles, I guess, and he's fine with that. Um, because it gives him the opportunity to be like, yeah, I don't carry too much around because why add to the weight of the psychological pain we all carry around on a daily basis? And she's like, wow, Greg, and I want to fucking die. And then Abby hugs him, which there really wasn't a reason to do, but physical contact, am I right, version 12 year olds? And then the teacher makes what I can, I, I don't, I've never heard anyone, but I can only guess that it's an unsolicited sexual comment towards teenagers and then she calls someone in Greg's words the F word and then explains that she gets away with it because she's old and nobody can fire her. Um, I, I went to an interesting high school which is its own multiple videos but I am not convinced that American public high schools are this badly run. Like that's gotta be illegal. Abby hugs Greg an uncomfortable amount just all the time and at one point the skin of her arm grazes his neck and he's way too fucking into it. Like you know how there's these misogynistic dress codes in some high schools where girls apparently cannot show their knees because men will absolutely lose their minds at the sight of like a naked woman's knee? Um, it's Greg. Greg is the one who those dress codes were created for because he's like holy shit an arm! So Greg and Abby talk on the phone at home and they just talk for hours and they, they're the only people in the world who understand each other and it's so deep! I still don't understand what is special about Abby besides having a sad life and arousing arms. So Greg's mom announces that she wants her and her kids to move in with her boyfriend who she's known for a number of months and has just met her kids. This means that Greg won't get to be close to Abby anymore. Ho oh, ho, oh, the plot thickens in like the most boring way you could possibly pull out of your ass. <laughs> but okay. Greg talks about how his his wonderful friend Davis keeps him afloat and, and how much he loves Davis and wishes he had more friends like him. In a scene where Greg says nothing, it's literally just Davis showering him in compliments and support and joking that he wishes they were dating, and I'm, I'm assuming that this is a joke because Greg takes it as a joke, but I love you and I wish you were my boyfriend is quite a lot in the category of friendly greetings. The absolute obsession that Davis has with making Greg laugh, complimenting Greg, emotionally supporting Greg is just a lot. Clearly Greg has done never done anything in return for this kid, but he's just like, wow, Davis is such a great guy. I love him. We are best friends. There is this scene where Greg tells Abby that his mom wants them to move away and it's just bad. It just doesn't read like any human interaction that has ever occurred. It's just, oh god. And I, I, I don't care to go full English major on Greg and rip this book apart that way because one, it's not interesting and two, we already know that Greg can't write for shit. This is merely a document of my attempt to get through this book and at this point I'm just exasperated. I just, I don't care about these characters. I don't want to hear about their boring lives. I, Abby has no personality traits. She, she has feelings that are, rea are a reaction in some way to Greg's feelings. She shows physical affection to Greg. She has a tragic backstory. 
okay? And why should I want to read this? Abby notices that Greg is kind of a dick to other girls, i.e. not making eye contact or paying attention when they speak to him. And he's like, I do it all on purpose so that you'll never, you'll never doubt me. You'll never doubt that I'm unhealthily obsessed with you and only you. Paraphrasing, but these kids are just so, so annoying. Now we have arrived at the school shooting scene. Greg and Davis get on a bus and then they get off the bus and then they hear shots and then they get on the bus again to hide. And at this point we completely forget that Davis exists and Greg is like, ah, Abby's ex-bad guy McBad shooting up the school, let me off this bus. And the driver's like, yeah, I guess I'll just let this kid get himself killed, his choice. Like, not an exaggeration, this man's just like, yeah, go fucking die. Um, and <laughs> so Greg gets off the bus because he has to go find Abby. He, the, your boy roller skates into a school shooting and then he just takes him off because there's blood on the floor. R.I.P. English literature, you had a good run. Greg sees Seth, the shooter, just in time for Jason to show up and tackle him. Apparently this kid's purpose in the story is just to materialize whenever punching needs to happen. So Jason tackles the shooter, Greg just leaves again to go find Abby. And th the entire purpose of this shooting is just to serve as trauma bonding for the two of them because that's romantic. Like I saw some blood and a bunch of my classmates are dead, but most importantly there's a girl in my bed. Also Greg's mom just lets Abby live with them and sleep in his bed now. We know that Abby's dad is an alcoholic and implied to be abusive, but we don't know if Greg's mom knows this. At no point is she like, well, I guess it makes sense to help this girl out and give her a stable place to stay while she's dealing with the trauma of witnessing a school shooting. But even if they did explain it logically, there would be no reason for her to sleep in Greg's bed. Just a bunch of kids, I think it was like over 50 kids, which would make it the deadliest shooting in all of US history. By the way, like 50 kids need to die and all logic is ignored just so that these two idiots I don't give a shit about can end up in a bed together. So according to Greg, family members of his murdered classmates are now at a statistically higher risk for suicide and depression, which is the most sociopathic attempt at empathy I have ever read. The school reopens and on the first day they have this speaker come in who has been sent by the president and he gives this speech that at best sounds like you put a coherent speech through a blender and then he's like, oh, the president is coming to your school to talk to every kid individually. And it doesn't make any sense. And then they Skype call the gym teacher on the projector screen in the gym. He was like in a fight with the shooter and he got shot a couple of times and he's just on this Skype projector to the entire school. All he does is explain his fight with the shooter in graphic detail and all the kids are like, yes, wow, throat punches. Because apparently that's what emotionally touches a room of traumatized kids. This is when we are forced to read the phrase bone shaking. Uh, Greg uses a lot of adjectives and metaphors that are just too much. Your bones were not shaken, Gregory. The point of good writing is to get your reader to feel what it is like to be in that moment. I feel like he thinks that the more dramatically he describes things, the better it is, which is just not true. This book is just way too much all the time. Greg and Abby finally kiss, and I swear to God, if I have to read them go any further, I'm going to need a lobotomy, but we're only halfway through this book, so my odds are not good. They walk by Abby's house, and her dad is there on the porch, and bad guy McBad number two, so it seems, just starts yelling some mean abusive bad guy things and then smashes a bottle over Greg's head and it's fine because the police were just there in the corner watching the whole time. Abby's dad gets arrested and she no longer has a available legal guardian so I guess she just lives with Greg now because that's a hundred percent how things work. Abby talks about how much she loves Greg and how he's such a great generous beautiful selfless guy and I don't know why I keep doing my straight girl voice every time I but okay, so she just goes on about how great he is, even though all he did was get hit in the head with a bottle. Like, he never tried to get her out of the situation, get her away from the abusive guy clearly upsetting her. He 
I just stood there and watched him monologue like, yeah, this guy's a dick, her life sucks, wow. So Davis is now suddenly being a dick to Greg, and Greg's like, well, he's probably upset that 50 of our classmates got murdered, which is a totally valid reason to be upset, but you know it's not gonna be that. You know he's gonna be jealous of Abby because everything in this book has to be about their stupid relationship. And then the president shows up at their school. I, he doesn't have a name, he's just the president. I'm assuming Obama was president at the time that Greg wrote this. So Obama's in this story now. He gets to their class and he immediately recognizes Greg for, apparently from the news coverage of the shooting. Meanwhile, why would Greg be in the news? He, and like, the, the president's going on about, oh, Greg is important and heroic. W like, what did he do? He just ran around looking for Abby. Why would he be in the news? He just, he got some glass in his feet from running around barefoot because he had to take his rollerblades off because he thought that rollerblades, he thought that a school shooting was the time for rollerblades. And Greg's like, Mr. President, what, a, what do you think of what people say about you in the news? And the president's like, I cannot. <laughs> I cannot and do not want to control what people say about me. All I can really fully control is what I myself am saying and doing. I find myself repeatedly stating that I came into office with the best intentions. Some decisions I have to make aren't always fair to me, my family, or many people around the world, but sometimes your only options lie between the end of a slipknot or the blade of a guillotine, and that's the burden I choose to carry. And then he's like, I'm increasing the budget of your school, and leaves. Abby tells Greg that Jason grabbed her butt in class. Clearly a theme here is that every man in her life is disgusting and abusive, except for Greg, who can do no wrong, so long as she compliments him incessantly and has no personality of her own. Greg's mom and sister are gonna move in with his mom's boyfriend, and so him and Abby just get to live in his family's old apartment while his mom pays for their food and utilities, it, like, bitch, in what world? He goes to the guidance counselor and she wants to talk about his relationship with Abby, which is su still super weird, and then she just cryptically implies that it's bad and then dramatically stares out the window and tells him to leave. And then comes the shower scene, which is just weird. Abby just really wants them to have a conversation while she's in the shower. I get that when you're in a relationship, the boundaries break down a lot, but she's so deliberate about it. She's like, this needs to happen. Okay, dude, I'm gonna get in the, sh I'm gonna get naked. I'm gonna get in the shower and you're gonna sit in the bathroom and we're gonna have a conversation. Like, okay, like come in now, I'm ready. I'm in a towel. Let's do, let's have this co weird conversation while I'm in the shower. This situation does not evolve naturally. Apparently she can't talk to him if she's not in the shower. Wouldn't that be loud too? But this, okay, this this needs to happen this way so that she can dramatically burst so naked and be like, look at my body ah! covered in self-harm scars. I'm so broken. But most importantly, there's a naked girl in front of Greg. Catch me skimming the next few pages as if it will burn my retinas if I look too long. I read this book in detail with the exception of the sex scenes. I refuse. That is, that this is where the line is drawn. I absolutely refuse. Ah! Greg's mom asks Davis to come over and help them pack to move because apparently she doesn't have any adult friends she can ask. She has to ask some random high schooler, which provides a very convenient opportunity for Davis and Greg to reconcile, which, so they just don't. Uh, Davis is still super jealous and uncomfortable around Abby because he, Greg is just so great and she's taking all of his time, I guess. Davis has this really, really painful to read, just completely unfunny childish humor, which is Greg's sense of humor on YouTube, and Greg in the book is just endlessly amused. Like, Davis is just the funniest guy ever, and he describes, Greg describes him and Abby as being like enchanted with Davis, which is just so weird. <laughs> He's so cringy in every way, and it's kind of unclear which character Greg sees him as in this case, because clearly Greg also wants to be like the funny guy that everyone loves being around, like Davis. So it's like, which which character are you right now, Greg? Like, make up your mind. Abby hands Greg a note again. These two are terrible at communicating, just cryptic notes, conversations in the shower. Like, they just, apparently it's too boring to just have a normal, mature conversation. So she hands him a note, and it turns out to be this whole gigantic letter with even more traumatic backstory. And apparently this whole time the guidance counselor has hated her because she's pro-life and Abby wanted an abortion after being raped. So that's 
That's why the guidance counselor hates her so much. This girl's life is just trauma bingo. I'm not trying to trivialize any of these issues. I'm just saying they sound ridiculous coming from a 30 year old man for the sake of feeding his own dramatic savior fantasy. Like, the only way that this story would have any real impact or meaning is if it was told by Abby. But that can't happen because she has no personality beyond being the damsel in distress and Greg doesn't give a shit about any of these issues beyond their ability to feed his own narrative and that is the tea. His response to this letter is to dramatically burst into her classroom, grab her, and start making out with her on a desk in front of the teacher and all of the class. Greg and Abby have apparently just reached enlightenment. Like, their lives are changed, everything is amazing forever just because they're having sex all the time. Like, the moral of this story is just no matter how shitty your life is, just get into a relationship. Grab the first vaguely woman-shaped cardboard cutout of a person and just have a lot of sex and you'll have nothing to worry about ever. Jason is still groping Abby in class and so Greg takes it upon himself to deal with her problems yet again. And he goes to the guidance counselor and this woman is like, no, I still don't like Abby. And this world where adults act like petty children honestly explains so much about Greg, but so so Greg loses his shit at this woman and is like, how dare you? You don't have the right to judge her when you don't even know her, which is so ironic because this entire book opened with a monologue about how that's exactly what he spends his time doing. And he basically tells this woman that she should blame herself for the school shooting because the shooter probably had mean, closed-minded parents like her. Greg decides that the the solution is that he has to confront Jason himself. He manages to single-handedly take on four jocks, which I feel so stupid saying the word jock because that's just not a word that people use unironically, you know what I mean? But So he single-handedly takes on four jocks by lassoing Jason's neck and kicking some people in the balls and there was a throat punch in there. He can just do that now. Greg is just standing there, the ground littered with jocks groaning in agony and everyone is like, oh my god, that's so impressive, Greg is amazing and the principal storms out and is like, what's going on children? And all of this builds to absolutely nothing, that's, that's it. And then Jason and Greg have a bonding moment where Greg is like, well Jason, I'm mad that you groped my girlfriend. You'd be mad if I groped your girlfriend. And Jason's like, wow, Greg, you're right. That's deep. Greg and Abby and Davis decide to skip school one day and they're driving on the freeway. And this is going to sound like it escalates incredibly quickly, but I promise you, this is exactly what the experience of reading the book feels like too. They witness a man jump off a bridge above the highway trying to kill himself. Davis jumps out of the car to try and save this man and immediately dies because he ran onto a fucking freeway. And Greg is apparently impervious to fast moving vehicles because he just grabs Davis's body no problem. Greg decides to blame himself for this because if he had never been born, Davis wouldn't be with him that way to die, which is a bit of a stretch. It's actually a lot of a stretch. It's, this kid died because he voluntarily ran in front of a moving vehicle to save a guy whose suicide you witnessed by freak accident, but it's your fault for being born. It's not even anyone's fault that they were born. The whole I'm distraught because my friend is dead passage also just sounds like a lizard person trying to emulate emotions. It's not convincing. I'm not convinced. And now Abby is all he has left in life. Kids, if your only source of joy and fulfillment in life, you're, you're literally the only thing you're interested in is a relationship. Stop it. Get some help. Don't even worry about it. Davis's mom is speaking at her son's funeral, her literal child who died dramatically days ago. And this is somehow still about Greg. She couldn't have told him this stuff in private. No, she's up there at her son's funeral like, Greg, I know you blame yourself, but you should know you're just such a good person for pulling his body off the freeway. And I understand. I understand why he was so obsessed with you now. You're just such a great guy. And Abby's like, yeah, Greg, you're just such a great guy. And Davis's mom comes over and hugs him in front of everyone. Davis's mom's speech also is just so weird. And it really highlights to me how everyone in this book speaks like Greg. Like after a while you just start to picture every character in this book as Greg in a different wig because they're all him. It's his voice coming out of every single one of them. It's just creepy. Unfortunately this is not tea. This is coffee. It's 
too early, but we had some technical, dif te technical difficulties last night. I'm having a lot of difficulties apparently. So Greg gets back to school and he gets cornered by the guidance counselor and this other teacher. And they tell him that they want him to run for school president. This random guy with no friends and no interests besides having sex with his girlfriend. And even Greg's like, you guys know I just assaulted four people outside the school the other day. And the guidance counselor, it's implied that she thinks they deserved it, but she doesn't say anything because she doesn't want to be unprofessional. Like, we, okay, this, we have found where this woman draws the line, I guess. It's still super concerning. It's still not where the line should be. She's also conveniently forgotten that he told her she was a bad person raising future school shooters, so there's no consequences to his insane actions. That's convenient, isn't it? The biggest plot hole in this book and if we were to represent the plot of this book, it would be a cobweb, don't get me wrong. But still the biggest hole in this book is that people like Greg. E everyone just thinks he's such a great guy and make it clear constantly. This book is just him living out a fantasy where he doesn't have to do any introspection, he doesn't actually have to be a good person. He gets to be the same weird creep, but this time everyone worships him for no reason. Greg and Abby are walking down the hall and the they see the guidance counselor and some police officers and they take Abby to the guidance counselor's office. So the issue is that she was dating the school shooter, right? And she wrote some letters that potentially could have inspired him to do it. So they're questioning her about that and then they decide she's innocent and the guidance counselor is very disappointed that she's innocent. But then they get back to Greg's place and Abby's like, but I'm not innocent! Because apparently she wrote that she wanted everyone to disappear in a letter to Seth when they were dating and... Which is not even close to telling him to shoot up a school or even implying it, but apparently this is a big deal because Greg storms out to go have an angst moment in the shower and then after long emotional deliberation comes to a completely obvious conclusion that she didn't do anything wrong and he comes out and he says he forgives her and she's she's so happy that he forgives her and she's so relieved because he she did but the guidance counselor apparently yelled loudly that she thought Abby was responsible for the shooting so now all the students just just think that for some reason and some kids throw paint at her or they throw paint on her clothes at school and then the principal gets involved and he just verbally abuses a student over the carpets getting ruined and screams about everything and is just a completely irrational NPC as all of these characters are and it's just painful to read it. I'm so glad I'm almost done at this point. So the principal gets on the school intercom and announces that Abby is innocent and that the guidance counselor needs to come to his office right now so they assume that the, he fired her and uh, so that night the guidance counselor burns down their entire school out of spite. Also Greg takes Abby's paint covered shirt and hangs it on the wall because it's about turning their pain and suffering into art and beauty. Hashtag deep am I right? virgin 12 year olds. Ah! So Greg and Abby go to the site of their burned down school and Jason is there and he's like, I mean that was pretty crazy am I right guys? The guidance counselor admitted it and she's in prison now. And uh, Abby starts laughing and then Greg has this moment where I also just picture him like staring directly into the camera like he's on the office and going, well I guess this means I can't run for school president now. And that's how the book ends. That's it. That's what we get. So this book is not very long. I got through it in a couple of hours, split over two days. Um, am I gonna read Onision's other books? Hell no. Could you probably pay me to? As in, if this video gets very successful, will I? Maybe. I don't have anything left to say about that. Thank you guys ever so much for watching. If you are new here, subscribe to my channel. If you are already subscribed, you know that I post once a week. But if you want even more, of my dumb face in your life. You can follow me on social media, you can join my Patreon, so Discord server. You can come hang out on my Discord server. It's a fun time, I promise. I just spilled my coffee on the floor. I need to stop and